So uh, now I'm, I'm delighted to present uh, Stephen Brands, uh, who is professor of politics uh, at NYU. And he's going to talk about game theory and the humanities. Professor Brands. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here to honor Marilda. Uh, I consider talking about current research, uh, and that could have been on voting or fair division or international security. Uh, but I was advised that uh, perhaps another topic, uh, more unusual applications of game theory, would be interest of interest. And since three years ago, um, I wrote a book called Game Theory and Humanities, uh, that seemed an appropriate, uh, less technical talk uh, and subject uh, for me to discuss. So what I'm going to try to do is uh, give you an overview of some of the uh, work done in the book. I actually have a copy of the book with me, and I'll pass it around. And I'm not going to be able to give very much detail, so what... Uh, we have done is uh, copy some of the figures in the book uh, of the simpler games. There are some more complicated models in the book. Uh, and I'll go through them rather quickly just to give you an idea of the kinds of applications which I consider not only unusual but very interesting in the classical humanities. By that I mean literature, history, philosophy, theology, and the law. Uh, so I'm going to take examples from all of these. But before I begin, uh, let me give you an idea of what I'm trying to do and illustrate this uh, with a story from the Hebrew Bible. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, one of the most famous stories, the so-called Akeda, uh, is uh, what happens when God commands Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, his only son. Uh, and what the Bible reports is that uh, Abraham uh, prepared his son for sacrifice. Uh, and in the end, uh, he did not sacrifice his son because an angel intervened and prevented his knife from killing Isaac. So many religious interpretations of this story uh, say that this obviously demonstrated that Abraham was a faithful servant of God uh, would even go so far as to sacrifice his only son. Uh, but a more strategic interpretation, an alternative hypothesis is that Abraham could surmise that this was only a test and God would not allow him to kill um, his son Isaac, uh, which indeed occurred. And uh, there's some <coughs> evidence in the Bible that Abraham was not above such calculation he tried to pass off his wife, Sarah, as his sister, so a pharaoh would not kill uh, him at the time. But more important, um, Abraham had been promised by God to found a great nation and help multitudinous descendants. So how could that happen if he sacrificed his only son? So this is an example, in my opinion, where strategic calculations were made by Abraham that he could go through the motions of sacrificing his son Isaac, but not worry too much that he would actually have to carry out the sacrifice. So these are the kinds of uh, stories uh, that I'm going to try to relate to game theories. Some pretty simple game theory, but I think uh, not entirely obvious. Uh, the um, title is in Portuguese because I previously talked about this subject uh, in Brazil but uh, you don't have to worry about my talking Portuguese. We'll go to the next slide and uh, begin with another Bible story. So can we go to the next slide? Oh, this is it. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, so uh, this might not be so clear, uh, so let me explain. There's another well-known story in the Bible. Uh, about the conflict between Samson and Delilah. Delilah is this beautiful woman, woman who Samson, a man of great strength, hankers after. Uh, not the first woman whom uh, uh, Samson had tried to uh, attract. Uh, the problem is that Delilah is in cahoots with the Philistines, who would like to uh, kill uh, 
or at least impede uh, Samson, uh, who was uh, this great warrior, a person of great strength. Um, and nobody quite knew where he had this, had, had, had this strength from. Uh, so uh, Delilah has a choice of either nagging or not nagging Samson for the secret of his strength. And uh, Samson has the option of telling or not telling the secret of his strength, which turns out to be his long hair. Uh, and um, he gives answers which are not correct in the beginning about the source of his strength. But after the third try, he does admit that it's his long hair that gives him this great strength. Uh, and the Philistines capture him, um, cut his hair, and then the consequences are pretty bad for Samson because he's mutilated. Uh, in the end, he gets his revenge because he's placed between two pillars of the stadium. Uh, his hair has grown back, and he pushes them apart and kills 3,000 Philistines by doing so, but he kills himself as well. So... Um, Delilah uh, has good reason to try to extract information from Samson, and Samson has good reason to try to withhold it. But he, in the end, is not successful. So what I indicate um, in this figure is uh, the payoffs. Now, I assume only ordinal payoffs. The players only rank outcomes from best to worst. Four is best, three is next best, two is next worst, and one is worst. So the higher the number, uh, the greater the payoff. But don't attach any... Uh, utility as such to these payoffs. It's just a ranking. So if you look at this um, <clears throat> payoff matrix at the top, uh, if Samson, <clears throat> if Delilah does not nag Samson, she's going to be unhappy, so she gets her next worst payoff of two. Uh, Samson, because he's unforthcoming, he doesn't tell the secret, and he's not nagged, uh, is very happy. He gets his best payoff of four. On the other hand, if he tells a secret, uh, Delilah will be happy. Uh, Samson's forthcoming, but now this is a reversal of role, so Delilah gets her best outcome, and Samson his next worst. Uh, if we go to uh, the strategy of nagging Samson, um, this is a bad outcome for both players, a mutually worst outcome of 1-1. One, one because Delilah's frustrated, Samson hasn't revealed the secret of his strength, and Samson's harassed by the woman he loves. Uh, finally, over here, if she nags him and she eventually gets him to tell a secret, which he does in this story, as I said, she's persuasive, but she had to go through some effort. So this isn't her best payoff. This is her next best payoff. And so Samson's reluctant. He sees risks, uh, but he doesn't quite anticipate the consequences. So this is kind of the next best payoff of both, before what actually happened occurred. So how do we explain this? The problem that the standard game theory has is that the upper left outcome is a Nash equilibrium outcome. So neither player would have an incentive to uh, move from this outcome. But I argue, based on <clears throat> some earlier work, a book called Theory of Moves, published by Cambridge in 1994, uh, that we can justify uh, Delilah's going from don't nag to nag, even though it's a terrible outcome for both players, because she anticipates that in the end, Samson will give in and tell his secret and move here. Uh, and uh, to <clears throat> argue this outcome uh, in game theoretic terms, I postulate in theory of moves that uh, players don't choose strategies simultaneously, the standard assumption of the normal form or strategic form of a game. They start at outcomes, which I call states, because they may only be temporary. And you consider moves and counter moves from the state. And then you do what we call backward induction. Uh, if there's a move here, a counter move here, possibly a counter counter move, uh, you reason backwards. Uh, and try to determine where, starting from a state like this, you'll end up. And the argument is that in this particular case, it would be a move here, Delilah nags Samson. Samson tells a secret. Now, it wouldn't go on because even though <clears throat> Delilah would do better going back to not nagging, uh, 
Sampson could move back to the beginning. So I start the backward induction argument assuming a move, counter move, counter counter move, and counter 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 move as possible. Um, <clears throat> And on that basis, I can argue that there would be a move from the Nash equilibrium outcome here to here, and then play would stop. So that's how I argue it was rational for Delilah to nag <coughs> Samson, and eventually for Samson to tell the secret of his strength. Uh, <coughs> any questions? Oops, what did I do? Oops. Uh, sorry. Okay. So here's another conflict uh, between sexes. Uh, this is based on the Greek tragedy, actually it's both comic and tragic, uh, play called Lysistrata. And in Lysistrata, the women, led by Lysistrata, uh, go on a sex strike against the men. They refrain from sex. So their choice is to refrain from having sex and not refrain. And the men in this uh, particular <coughs> historical period have the choice of fighting wars and not fighting wars. And at those times, uh, this is ancient Greece, uh, men preferred to fight than not to fight. And the women were desolate. They were abandoned and very upset. Uh, so... <laughs> This is a quite bad outcome for the women when they don't refrain and the men are off fighting wars. It's the best outcome for the men. As I said, they really like to fight at those times. Um, and uh, what <coughs> this Estrada does is rally the women to abandon uh, sex, which is a frustrating outcome for everybody. It's frustrating uh, for the women because the men are still off fighting, but it's also frustrating for the men. Um, but this explosion that she creates uh, induces the men to consider to coming home from war, not fighting. This would be a partial success for the women, uh, not a complete success because they're still not enjoying sex. It's a disaster for the men because they're losing on both counts. Uh, they're not fighting and they're not having sex. So now there's an incentive to move down here. And that's what actually happens in the play. Uh, and Liz Strader is ultimately successful. Uh, again, we start at a Nash equilibrium outcome, which normally would be stable. Neither play has an incentive to move. Uh, the women don't have an incentive to move from two to one, their worst outcome. And the men certainly don't have an incentive to move from their best outcome. But by escalating the conflict, by refraining from sex, Liz Strader is successful in inducing from this bad outcome for the men to come home from war and uh, eventually the women agree to resume sex. Pardon me? Oh yes, it, it's a play. And a film, okay, I haven't seen the film, I've seen the play. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a theological game I uh, discuss, uh, and this is whether you should uh, believe in God, or as I say, a superior being, SB. Incidentally, it's purely coincidental that those are my initials. <laughs> <laughs> Who plays against an ordinary person, P. And... Uh, SB has a choice of revealing itself, but that would establish its, its existence, I'm going to say its, not he or she, or not revealing itself and not establishing its existence. And uh, the person has a choice of believing in SB's existence or not believing in SB's existence. So if we go through quickly these choices, I associate payoffs with them, but instead of just making an argument that uh, these are the best, next best, and so on, payoffs. I do this, well, I do this lexicographically, which means I postulate a primary goal for each player and a secondary goal. So the primary goal for SB is he wants P to believe in his or her existence. Uh, and that's an overwhelming theme uh, throughout the Bible. 
that if God wants anything, he wants belief in his existence, particularly by his chosen people, the Israelites. Uh, so that means that his two best outcomes, going back to his, three and four, are associated with the person's believing, and his two worst are associated with non-belief. But to break the tie between two best and two worst, I assume that <clears throat> SB prefers not to reveal itself. Uh, the reason is, if SB revealed itself, there would not be a test of faith. And this should be a test, um, <clears throat> so that you believe without evidence. And similarly, I have secondary and primary goals for P. P wants belief or non-belief in SB's existence confirmed by evidence, or lack thereof, so P's two best outcomes, four and three, are associated with there being evidence, revelation, and therefore a good reason to believe, or non-revelation, and <clears throat> a good reason not to believe. So this is an agnostic of a scientific bent. He wants evidence of the lack thereof. And uh, the secondary goal to break the tie between the two best and the two worst is that uh, P prefers to believe in SB's existence. So he's willing to give SB the benefit of the doubt. Well, what do we have here? We have a Nash equilibrium outcome, which is next worst for both players. That's a prediction of standard game theory. Um, that's worse for both players than belief with revelation. So there's a problem here. It's akin to the problem in a famous game called Prisoner's Dilemma. Right. On the other hand, there are two what I call non-myopic equilibria. When you think ahead and do the backward induction calculation, it depends on where you start. And these are the two possibilities of uh, ending up if you're farsighted. Uh, and I'm not going to go into details, but it gets you out of this particular equilibrium. And I think what we observe through the ages are periods in which uh, there's belief without evidence uh, and then <clears throat> there are ages in which uh, a more scientific view, the Enlightenment period, for example, uh, people demand evidence. Uh, and what I would argue is that this game cycles over the ages. So we go through periods of religious revival and religious decline, and there's a kind of basic instability indicated by the arrows. So, for example, from this good outcome for both players, there's an incentive for SB not to reveal itself, and then an incentive, therefore, not to believe, and then if we go up here, this is a very bad outcome, but if the, uh, <clears throat> if SB uh, wants to induce the better outcome, it should reveal itself, and then they'll have belief again. So that's the kind of instability in this game, I argue, actually occurs over the ages. Oops. No. This is, yeah. Okay, this is... Wait a minute. I, I must have skipped ahead. Okay, so then now we're at a... Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's a little better to point. Okay, so this is uh, Shakespeare's play Macbeth, and I pick up the action early in the play. Uh, the conflict between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth, you might remember if you've read the play, that uh, three weird sisters indicate to Macbeth that he might be the future king. And uh, Lady Macbeth is even more excited by that prospect and uh, they invite um, the king to visit their castle. And uh, at that particular point, uh, Macbeth has doubts. Uh, should he really kill the king in his own castle? Um, and then Lady Macbeth comes into the picture, and she takes a very firm stance that uh, we plan this... Uh, particular murder, it should be carried out. So she has a choice between inciting Macbeth to murder King Duncan or not inciting him to murder King Duncan. And Macbeth has the option of being an accessory to the crime or not. 
And uh, <clears throat> we start off where there's no incitement and uh, Macbeth is not going to kill. So Lady Macbeth gets very upset by that fact. And she, as I said, is more ambitious than uh, Macbeth, her husband. And she makes her famous unsex me speech. She says, come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood and stop up access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell spirit. That no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell spirit. And then a few lines later she says, Come thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes. I know, I missed my profession. I should have been an actor. <laughs> I did have the lead in my senior play, but it went downhill afterwards, so I became an academic. Okay, so let's look at this game. Uh, <clears throat> we start out here. Again, we have a Nash equilibrium outcome, so standard game theory predicts it's stable. But I argue that Lady Macbeth, given her willfulness, has good reason to escalate the conflict and incite Macbeth, even accusing him of cowardice, uh, unmanliness, uh, to um, go from <clears throat> not kill, because as soon as she starts in the incitement, this is a bad outcome for both, a terrible outcome for both, and then a rather weak figure that he is, he eventually goes along and they kill King Duncan. Uh, and this is actually quite a good outcome for both players in the beginning, but then if you read the rest of the play, things unravel more quickly, and uh, everybody dies in the end. It's a tragedy. <laughs> oh, I keep going back. Why do I go back? Okay, now we switch to politics, and we look at the, the U.S. Civil War. Um, and that happened in the early 1860s, and it was a conflict between the Union, the North for the most part, and the Confederacy, the South. And uh, here I have generic strategies of compromising and not compromising on the issue of slavery, the overwhelming issue in American politics from the 1820s to the 1860s. Uh, there were compromises reached in the 1820s, even into the 1850s. Uh, but by the 1860s, this became an irreparable conflict, and the South, the Confederacy, attacked the North at Fort Sumner, South Carolina. And uh, they won early victories. The problem in explaining why that happened is the South was vastly inferior in terms of resources. Why would it attack the North, uh, knowing that in a prolonged war it would win? But it was hoping that it wouldn't be a prolonged war uh, and that these early victories uh, would convince the North that it would be a terrible mistake to uh, fight uh, to the end uh, against slavery. And maybe the North would negotiate and the slave states would stay as they are. They might secede from the Union um, and that would satisfy them. What they did is underestimate the doggedness of Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, to pursue a fight to the very end. So this became the bloodiest war in American history, 700,000 deaths, more than in either World War I or World War II. Uh, and the population was a fraction of what it was uh, in 1860. Uh, so how do we explain this war? So uh, the argument is that... <clears throat> This is a bad outcome. It persisted for four years. Um, I argue that if the Union submits, this would be a terrible outcome for the Union and uh, the best outcome for uh, the Confederacy. This is almost the opposite. It's a, it wouldn't be such a bad outcome uh, for the Union. <clears throat> uh, uh, well, the comparison is this is a bad outcome for the Confederacy uh, this is a worse outcome for the Union. This is a Nash equilibrium outcome, so it predicts that the Confederacy uh, should have uh, submitted, 
uh, knowing the strength of the North, but it did not. Uh, so, in my opinion, what happens here is that the strategy of the South fails uh, because, Nixon, uh, because Lincoln persists. Uh, and even though game theory does not usually predict outcomes that are terrible for both sides, this is why the Civil War ensued uh, to the very end. Back again. Keep going. Okay. So I think this uh, probably is a familiar uh, story to many of you. It's Shakespeare's Hamlet, another Shakespearean play. And uh, this is particularly interesting because uh, the normal explanation for what happens in the play is that Hamlet, who suspects that his uh, uncle killed his father, poisoned his father, and then quickly married his mother, um, but he doesn't have evidence. And usually the interpretation is that he was this vacillating, indecisive character who couldn't make up his mind. My interpretation is that uh, Hamlet was very strategic, but he didn't have the goods. He didn't have sufficient evidence that um, Claudius was a murderer of his father. So what happens in the play is there's a play within the play. And in the play within the play, the murder is reenacted. And uh, Claudius is in the audience, is very embarrassed, angry, walks out. And then finally, Hamlet has the evidence that uh, almost surely Claudius murdered his father. So he goes after Claudius, but Claudius knows that Hamlet is uh, now understanding that he is a murderer, and Claudius goes after Hamlet. And in the end, of course, both die. Um, everybody dies. <laughs> so Hamlet has a choice of revealing or not revealing that he knows Claudius is the murderer of his father. And Claudius has the choice of killing or not killing Hamlet or trying to kill or not kill Hamlet. And um, if there's non-revelation, it's a kind of failure for Hamlet uh, if Claudius kills him. If uh, there's non-revelation and he doesn't kill, this is dishonor for Hamlet because he didn't act when he should act. Uh, this is success for Hamlet if he reveals and then uh, Claudius doesn't do anything, but Claudius does something and we end up up here. And that's actually the Nash equilibrium outcome in this game as well as the non-myopic. So when players think ahead, uh, they would go to the Nash equilibrium in this game, unlike some of the earlier games. So that's my explanation for <clears throat> the strategic interpretation of Hamlet, uh, in which I interpret as a basically a stalking game between uh, Hamlet and Claudius. Each is stalking the other and trying to figure out when to act. And when both act, they both die. OK, this is uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962, uh, in which the United States uh, <clears throat> discovered that uh, the Soviet Union had placed intermediate range and medium range missiles in Cuba, nuclear missiles in Cuba and uh, demanded that they be withdrawn and put up a blockade around Cuba, a naval blockade, which was euphemistically called a quarantine at the time. But, they had, but the United States considered escalating the conflict to an airstrike. The problem was that the US Air Force estimated the probability that uh, it would be successful to be about 90%, which wasn't 100%, which means some missiles could have been uh, shot and hit the southern part of the United States. Um, and the common interpretation of this game is that it was a game of chicken. And in chicken, there's a compromise outcome, which eventually the two sides reached. But then there's a uh, mutually worst outcome, uh, which is commonly interpreted to be nuclear war. What's wrong with this interpretation is that even President Kennedy at the time estimated the probability of war, not even nuclear war, to be between one-third and one-half. So it was not a certainty that there would be nuclear war and therefore a mutually worst outcome. And here, the United States wins, the Soviets lose. Here, the, the opposite, 
These are the Nash equilibrium outcomes. There's also a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium in this game. And what we don't explain is how the compromise was reached. Now, it is a <coughs> non-myopic equilibrium um, in the game of chicken, but I think the better representation of this game is the following. In this game, <coughs> same strategies, blockade, air strike, withdrawal of the missiles, maintenance of the missiles. Um, <coughs> this I interpret as a U.S. victory and U.S. capitulation. So this is even a worse outcome than in chicken. It's not 2-4, it's 1-4. This is not a 4-2 uh, outcome, this is a 2-2. Two -two. Because if the United States escalated the air strike, and the Soviets were in the process of withdrawing their missiles anyway, this would be a dishonorable U.S. action. The Soviets would be thwarted, but it would be a sneak attack, like the Japanese on Pearl Harbor. In fact, Bobby Kennedy, the attorney general advisor to President Kennedy at the time and his brother, said this would be a Pearl Harbor in reverse, uh, blackening the name of the United States in the annals of history. Uh, so... Of course, it's bad for the Soviet Union, but it's also bad for the United States. On the other hand, this would be an honorable U.S. action because if the Soviets continued to maintain the missiles, we would be justified in escalating to airstrike. Now, it turns out that uh, the unique... So we still have the compromise outcome in this game. It's a unique uh, non-myopic equilibrium uh, wherever you start, and that means that... <clears throat> That means that we now have justification for this as the uh, outcome, and that's the outcome that actually occurred after 13 days of negotiation, uh, mostly secret, uh, between the Soviet Union and the United States. And the uh, Soviet Union withdrew their missiles from Cuba after the 13 days, and uh, the United States lifted the blockade. Okay, how many of you have read the novel Catch-22? Anybody? This is, was a famous uh, novel of the 1960s. It actually was published in 1961. Uh, and it describes the experience of a combat pilot whose name is Yossarian uh, during World War II, flying missions in Italy. And uh, he's trying to get off um, flying duty and he has to, in order to do so, uh, speak to a psychiatrist uh, to be relieved from combat duty. And the psychiatrist's name is uh, Dr. Danica, and he can judge Yossarian insane, and then he's off from duty, or he can judge him sane, and Yossarian has to uh, de decide whether to ask or not ask to be relieved. Uh, but if he asks, he's obviously sane. <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> Therefore, it's a bad outcome for Dr. Danica when he asks uh, to uh, judge him insane because he has to do a lot of paperwork, and uh, that's bothersome to Dr. Danica. Uh, if he judges him insane, sane, uh, it's a dishonorable outcome for Yossarian because he'd be deserting his buddies uh, to get off combat duty. On the other hand, if he doesn't ask, he could be judged insane then he would have combat duty uh, and insanity, uh, but he would show no heroism. And uh, finally, if he's judged sane uh, and he doesn't ask, he'd have combat duty and sanity. So I have um, payoffs associated with these different outcomes. And um, what's interesting about this game is it cycles. One to two, so... Dr. Danica has an incentive to depart from one to two. Uh, Yossarian has an incentive to depart from one to three, three to four, and two to four. So that's why this game cycles. Um, and the only way to induce an outcome uh, is what I call <clears throat> moving power. So this game is kind of played over and over again. And uh, if one player has moving power, as I define it, uh, 
it can continue moving when the other player has to stop. Uh, so the double arrows indicate that the psychiatrist has uh, moving power. He always can move down or move up. And then Yossarian would have to decide where to stop. And the choice would be between 3-3 three, three and 1-4. And 3-3 three, three, <coughs> uh, for Yossarian is better than 1-4. So that's where he would stop. What actually happens in the novel is that uh, Yossarian decides this is a stupid game, he's not going to win, and what he does is go AWOL, absent without leave, and decides, in effect, not to play the game. And a catch-22, which is now part of English vocabulary, and I think uh, international vocabulary, is essentially a situation in which you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. It's a very frustrating situation. So what I'm trying to do in the novel is show uh, that it actually can be analyzed using this kind of theory. Finally, let me go to a more serious application of a catch-22. Um, <clears throat> whoops. Why am I having so many, so many problems with this? Oh, sorry. Uh, this game came up. Um, and this is the Iran hostage crisis of 1979-1980. Uh, it's very small. I know you can't read it so well. But let me just try to show how you can introduce incomplete information using this theory. So this was a game played between President Carter and uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, who displaced the Shah of Iran after the revolution. And uh, Carter has a choice between negotiating or not or intervening militarily to try to rescue the hostages. And how many has a choice also of negotiating or obstructing negotiations? And basically the message of this uh, is that there was a real game and there was a um, game as misperceived by Carter. So the game as misperceived by Carter is the top game. Uh, the real game is the second game. And misperceived means that he misperceived Khomeini's preferences. So he thought that it would be next best if there were a compromise outcome. But in fact, it's next worst for Khomeini. So the consequence is that you have these two non-myopic non equilibria in the game that was misperceived. Carter thought he could induce this. But in the real game, there's only one. And that's where Khomeini obstructs, even though uh, Carter tries to negotiate. Eventually, Carter orders a mission to try to rescue the hostages. It's aborted uh, at the last minute. The hostages are never uh, <clears throat> released. And only when President Reagan uh, is inaugurated in January of 1980 are the hostages released, a new president, a new regime. Okay, so this is the application of a catch-22 game, which I actually make a generic kind of game, uh, which is to say uh, it's a whole class of games, and this is a different one from the game played in the novel, but it still qualifies as a frustrating situation. It's frustrating because <clears throat> uh, the situation is one in which women were accused of uh, witchcraft. Uh, this also happened in the United States, in New England, uh, but it was more serious in medieval Europe, where reputedly about 100,000 witches were executed, uh, mostly women, about two-thirds were women. And the primary goal of the accusers was to confiscate the property of the witches, uh, the accused witches. So uh, the accusers have their choice of torturing and not torturing uh, the accused witches, uh, and the accused witch has a choice of confessing or not confessing her alleged crimes. Of course, it was uh, not, for the most part, a <laughs> true crime. Um, and I'm particularly interested in uh, <clears throat> the outcomes for the accused witch. So if the accusers torture the witch, the accusers should be break the law by torturing after a confession. So even in medieval times, uh, it was verboten to... Uh, extract a confession under duress through torture. So this would actually be a bad outcome for the accusers if she confessed when they were tortured, when she, she was tortured. On the other hand, this would be an honorable death 
when she doesn't confess, despite being tortured. Uh, this is acquittal when uh, there's no torture and she doesn't confess. And finally, this is a dishonorable death where <coughs> the accusers don't torture, but she confesses anyway. And um, for the most part, uh, this did not occur uh, because not only did the torturers want to uh, confiscate the alleged witch's property, but they wanted her to implicate other people. And it would be dishonorable to, uh, without torture, confess and implicate other people. So, uh, again, I use moving power, moving around and around, because if uh, the torture, <coughs> was a, torture was carried out and there was a confession, uh, this was not sufficient. So sh the torture had to begin again or be threatened again. And finally, for the most part, these confessions were extracted. So that's an idea of how one, I think, may use game theory or this theory of moves, which I mentioned earlier, to understand the thinking of people, particularly human decision makers. Game theory is used in evolutionary biology and other fields where I think um, people do not, or animals, non-human animals for the most part do not, as far as we know, think ahead. But human beings think ahead. And therefore, I think it's useful to define an equilibrium concept in which you allow for that with specific rules. And it seems to explain quite well outcomes in many of these situations. Uh, when people do think ahead, estimate the consequences of actions and uh, reactions and so on, and um, I think give a new view of what is going on. Now, you can say <clears throat> uh, that uh, some of the actions are rational. For example, uh, the Civil War in the 1860s, which was so devastating, uh, but sometimes uh, these outcomes occur in difficult games. Also, I think what one can get out of the humanities is uh, ideas that go beyond simple preferences. Um, it seems to me that um, one common accusation against game theory is that, <clears throat> uh, well, it can't deal with emotions. It can't deal with uh, feelings like anger or jealousy or even love. Well, in my opinion, uh, these emotions are often uh, quite rational. And they show commitment, for example. And uh, under those circumstances, uh, they should be part of the game. For example, my quotation from Lady Macbeth, where she steals herself for the murder of King Duncan. That's a very strong um, emotion, which I think can be interpreted as a strong preference. And it forces uh, Macbeth in the end to go along with this woman who is not going to compromise. I think I better stop there. I'm probably about out of time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So now we have a, a few minutes for questions. First of all, thank you for your speech. It's very interesting and uh, congratulations. Um, I'm Russian and uh, my question will, uh, will be about Crimea crisis. I just want to know your opinion, maybe your think about uh, some, what is the best outcome for Crimea in this crisis? Is it was the best decision or not as for you? Uh, I'm not capable of answering that question. Uh, <laughs> No, and just as as a theory, is it to... Um... Well, to apply the theory, it seems to me, one would have to set up the game. Uh, even a simple game, like a two-by-two two game, requires a lot of thought and justification. Uh, and if the game is more complicated than each player is having two strategies, then uh, the big game becomes larger and more difficult to analyze using this kind of theory. So I think I cannot give you a top-of-the-head answer on that one. Sorry. Mm, thank you, anyway. Okay. There, there was another question there. Uh, yes. Uh, but tasks 
That's the same kind of question I just asked. Sorry, sorry, I was, I was, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? Please wait for the microphone. Sorry, uh, just a clarification about this last last game. Where the torture in this case would not uh, torture to death, the ex execution would come afterwards. Ju or is it a torture? It's either you d torture, are tortured to, da to death or confess, or just. Uh yeah, you, I mean, the, the usual. Uh the usual choice that uh, these accused witches have was to try to endure torture, and a few did survive. A few uh, were tortured and uh, refused to confess, and even after several uh, tries did not confess. And that's why we have documentation of this from medieval sources. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it was a catch-22. If you didn't confess, you were tortured, and eventually you did confess. Um, if you confessed, then they had the goods on you, and you were probably killed anyway. So that's why it was a very frustrating situation. For the purpose of this game, you assume the don't confess the witch state, and if you are tortured, you will confess. For, for the, the most part. Stage. For the most part. Yeah. Yes. Thank you.